Hello everybody. Hello everybody and welcome to the Celtic Unrestricted View podcast. My name is Ryan Crawford and well what an episode we have this episode on a Wednesday evening. First evening shall I say, get my days mixed up. I'm joined by ex-Celtic player Mark Reid. Um, this is probably more for the older generation, um, guys like my dad's age etc. Um, Mark played left back for Celtic um, I think it was the 1980s Mark, is that correct? Yeah, yeah it was. Um, and I'm absolutely, it's a pleasure to have you on, mate, because you've played alongside some, shall I say, Celtic icons and legends. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thanks for having me on, Ryan. I appreciate no, it. No, it's my pleasure, mate, because as I say, you've played, I've, I would say, a very good Celtic team with some very good icons and legends, mate. So I could say I'm in a, I'm in a pleasure to have a legend status here, mate. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice of you to say it, but. I'm not quite that standard, but I'm glad I played for Celtic. I mean, and I think nowadays uh, my children who are all grown up get a lot of satisfaction from me having played. Do you know what I mean? They really do. I, I, that's probably something as well you can always say to people, by the way. <laughs> you played for Celtic. <laughs> so no. um, it's still something you hear very often that you can say something your family played for Celtic. <laughs> I remember one time up recently I was in a pub in Glasgow. We were going up to a game with my best friend and it was Celtic supporters we were talking to and I always, I don't say too much about it all unless unless somebody brings me into the conversation. I don't bum about anything and my pal who hates that, he hates the fact that I just keep quiet and he'd had enough and he said, he said, listen, do you know he played for Celtic? Do you know what I mean? And he, he gave the full repertoire, do you know what I mean? So he enjoyed that. I think that's something to be fair. See, see, even if I played one game with Celtic, I'd be saying, I'd be saying it in nightclubs and pub bar. I played with Celtic. <laughs> it's a big thing. It's a, it really is. And as you get older, you can appreciate it big time. You know what what you achieved, and you know it doesn't matter how however long it was or whatever you you, you made or whatever. It's just it's a great achievement. Because obviously back then as well, um, I don't know how it works, eh, Mark, but see back then when you kind of grew up, was all, um, see obviously now it's a pro you set up, did that exist back then? Or was it mainly just that you had to kind of just play in the streets and then hopefully get picked up somehow? No, I uh, I played for my school, St Andrews Academy. Oh, all right. And I played under 15, which was third year. But because of my age group, I was eligible to play under 14 and I got an invite up to Celtic Boys Club just for training and I'm up to training and uh, Charlie Nicholas was there uh, and I, I played with the uh, under 14s and I think at the end of that season I think I was there about four months and I got asked uh, to sign a schoolboy form right. so in May 1976 I signed a schoolboy form which I was over the moon with See, see, when you sign the schoolboy forms, do you, do you not get paid at that point? Is it only when you sign kind of full time? Well, what that basically means is that during school holidays, uh, summer holidays, you will get an invite up to Celtic Park to train. Right. That's what it means. You get expenses. I think I get five pound a week. <laughs> five pound a week. But, but I'm guessing, I'm guessing five pound a week back then still, still extra money. It was good. It was good to get. Uh, and then but under 16, after that season, I think it, just before I was 17, I get made up to the ground ground staff. Uh, and George McCluskey's brother was there, John McCluskey, oh, right. uh, Fryer, who was a great player and a tragedy that he never had a long career. Do you know what I mean? He was an absolutely brilliant player. So I was on the ground staff and then I was into the reserve side. That's quite interesting. Um, say that. So is that basically kind of you learning your trade in a way as well? Uh, it's learning your trade. You're up there. At, I used to go up with Bobby Lennox and Roy Aitken, uh, and then you would get all the kit out. I remember Jock, Jock Stein was there at the time, and I remember him uh, in the dressing room, intimidating when you're 14 years of age, do you know what I mean? 15 years of age, 16 years of age. Uh, so he was a, he was the manager at that time, and then he'd had his accident, and Sean Fallon was taking over at that point. So he he did my schoolboy for him, uh, and then I was on the ground staff 
which I thoroughly enjoyed. She um, did you have any did like the managers of the first team? What you said, Jock Dean Fallon, etc. Did they do any? Did they deal with the, the youths at all, or were they predominantly the first really. team? Not really, no, nothing, nothing. I was still at. I was uh, when I was on the ground staff. I was still at Celtic Boys Club, finishing off with them, and then I went into the reserve side. And I was, I can't remember how many times I played there. And then it was November 1980. The the team had, you know, suffered a few defeats. And that's when we get called into with myself and John Weir and John Halpin played in the League Cup semi final against Indy United. Obviously, um, for me now, Mark, um, I, I think football, the way kind of kids and teenagers grow up and play football, it's all changed. Um, uh-huh. When I was younger, I'm only 28, but when I was younger, as soon as you came in for school, it was playing football out with your pals and your school gear, dirty knees, dirty shoes, you were just, you're marshalled for dinner, you didn't want to come in, it was rushed, yeah. dinner rushed on your neck to get back out and play, you were feeling sick, but you didn't care, you just wanted to play football, um, nine o'clock and you were like, did I need to come in, ma, I want to play football, and at school you played football, that was all it was back then, and obviously now it's more... It's more computers and let's, let's be honest, guys are wanting to go and get drunk and see women. Football yeah. don't really. Obviously, for me, now the money's more taken over than the actual enjoyment of the game. But see, back yeah. when you were younger, was that all you've really done as well? Was just play football on the streets and learn, basically learn your football yeah. skills on the street? Well, your dad's of an age similar to me. I'm a bit older. Uh, I played in the streets with a lamppost and a, a jumper down as the other goal. and. There wasn't a lot of cars about the street, that's the thing. Uh, and we used to play there, and there'd maybe be about 12, 12 kids all playing. And then we played in each other, we had competitions playing in each other's back gardens, always out. And then at school, do you know what I mean? The, the school, I used to, at primary school, I used to go home for my lunch, and I ran about a mile and a half. Now, I left school at 20 past 12 at lunchtime, and I had to be back down. The glebe was an area of grass, and the 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 head teacher had uh, a league where all the boys all played at lunchtime. Do you know what I mean? So we all played from five to one to twenty five past one before we went back into school. So that was the kind of upbringing. Because I think um, for me, Mark, I don't know what you think, but I think it's kind of I don't know if it's just society as a whole, but I think that's kind of non-existent now. Really, the way. Uh, because even, even the schools now, sometimes at lunchtime you go past schools and you don't really see a lot of wee boys that play football anymore. No, um, it, is, it is non-existent. It is, as you say, computers and the internet and everything else is taking a big a big hit in the, the youngsters. But do you think that as well was maybe a, a plus to a lot of players back in your day because all you really had was the street and football and your pals? I, I wouldn't change a thing about it. I wouldn't change a thing about it. For the chance again, I would go back out in the streets. I, I, I love seeing it. Obviously, you can't do it now with the kids, the cars and all that. It's a bit not practical, but it just, it's a great error. Great error to do it. And I remember at school, uh, I used to play at 10 o'clock in the morning, a Saturday morning, and we would finish about quarter to 12. I lived quite close to the school, so I ran, I ran home my mother had my lunch ready and then I had to run to the railway station and I had to get the train at 25 past 12. So between 40 and 45 minutes for leaving the school, I was on the train to Glasgow for, with, with my unit with Celtic Blazer on, uh, get up to meet at uh, Glasgow Station, do you know what I mean? Because I, I just find it interesting how like the, the world was changing football. Like It was just all about football Back then, for me anyway, I think most men remember the same back then. It was just yeah. your pals and football. And um, and obviously back then, m- money was probably never, ever in the equation. It was just, I want to play football. And obviously, as a Celtic fan, it's probably to play with Celtic. That was all I wanted to do. Um, when, I, when I went onto the ground staff, I get £20 a week. And I, th- I come out with 18, I think I get £2 off for tax or national insurance. And I thought it was great. <laughs> But now, but now, if that's the case, it's probably two. It's probably two, two and a half grand a tax. Do you know what I mean? It's 
Um, but it just shows you as well that how things have changed for your day. Like you said, twenty pound and you were happy. Uh huh. Back back in these days, some players are no are, are unhappy with two hundred grand a week. <laughs> I know, I know, and it is a bit extreme. Do you know what I mean? I think the the money side of things is way way out of control. Do you know what I mean? But people people have allowed it to to be that way. But fair dues to them if they if they can get it. Then why would you turn it down? I, that's something I've always said, Mark, as well. Especially you can maybe look at some guys that left Celtic, Edward and Barry, even uh, Tierney. Yes, you want to be staying play with Celtic, but when you're getting a carrot dangled in front of you, it's it's very hard these days to knowing knowing that your career could could end in what, two days' it time. Could. It could. I think I think Kieran Tierney is an absolutely brilliant player. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely brilliant. I wish he'd went to Man United. I like Man United as well as Celtic. Uh, I do not know why they never come in from. But he's a great player and I think it was the right time for him to go and the club needed the money and they had to invest and, and move on. He was a great servant to the club, do you know what I mean? It's something that obviously, Mark, you played left back and maybe since Tierney we've kind of struggled. Obviously, Greg Taylor's done okay this year, but um, we've kind of struggled to get a solid left back. Why do you think left back is a hard place to, to kind of find a, a very good player? Is it because they're left footed? Because there's well, not a lot of talented left players about these days, or is it the position itself? Left-footed players are in the minority, do you know what I mean? I don't know why there might have been a problem with that position. I think Kieran Tierney is the epitome of what a fullback should be. Absolute well, class. I, I think, for me, he's, he's one of the best in the world. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people say between him and Robertson, I think um, Tierney's probably get the edge over Robertson. Um, I don't think there's much in it. And they're, they're slightly different players. Uh, you would have either. You would have either. Two good but, Celtic supporters. Maybe that's me being biased because he's played with Celtic. I don't know. But um, I just think, for me, when Tierney was at Celtic, I just think, it, I think most fans knew he was too good. And it, it, you kind of hoped it would last. Yeah. Because he's a Celtic fan, he grew up a Celtic fan and Played through the, the youth ranks, you're thinking, no, he'll stay, he'll stay. But when you're getting a move to even, I know Arsenal might not be the Arsenal that they used to be, they're still a big club in terms yeah. of history and, yeah. and money as well. I think it's very hard to, as you said, Mark, to not back. I think it was 75 grand a week he was met by getting offered. Yeah. It. It's very, very hard to, to yeah, say no to that. I don't begrudge him at all. And I, I do think it was, you know, you'd like him to have stayed, but. It was the right time. He got. They, they should have got more money from. I mean, the the money that they got is nowhere near enough. Nowhere near enough. I I think now looking back, twenty or twenty five million. I think um, it was probably a bit of daylight robbery. I would say for Arsenal. The same with Van Dijk. And now he's probably maybe the, if not the best in the world in, in defence. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It just shows you the way how the, the markets work as well. Um, yeah. It's obviously for yourself. Obviously, before we come on, you kind of told me how you got your debut, but did you have an inkling um, that you were going to make your debut at all, or was it just out of the blue? I started my career as a left winger. Then it was like an old inside left, number 10, then midfield. So for some reason, I was gradually working my way back. But I knew that, I knew that the players at Celtic to get into the midfield would might have been a struggle because Paul McStay was coming through as well and a lot of good players. So I played left back and set a lot of games for the reserves. And I, we played a lot of games against the first team in practice games. And I always did reasonably well when I was up against Davy Proven and a few others. And obviously it stood me in good stead that, he, that they thought I was ready to, to play that game or, or the gamble of playing that first mm -hmm. game. Because obviously you can speak to other professionals and some of them, they, they've always got a wee inkling they might make their debut. Um, but seeing you made your debut, was it a, obviously back then, like you say, you, you were playing with very, very talented players. Were you nervous at all with your debut? Or is it because you, you already trained and played with him? It was fine to just step in and knew you could do the job? No, you'd be very nervous. You'd be very nervous going to the game. Uh, it was a big thing for yourself and your family. Not want to let anybody down. Want to do yourself justice. 
Uh, but once you went out there, you've just got to go on with it. Do you know what I mean? You've got to go on with it and not let the occasion get to you. But we did well. Uh, we did well that night. Not so well in the second leg where we got beat, but we did well the first game. A question there as well from the, from the YouTube stream, um, Mark. Uh, how, obviously, you played under Bergen McNeil. How is Bergen McNeil as a manager? Uh, very... Sh- how was Billy McNeil? He was a good manager. I don't think he was he was uh, great at, at, with the younger boys, maybe giving them the confidence mm-hmm. uh, that he should have. But it's not it's not a big criticism. Do you know what I mean, it's just he had a lot of players to deal with. But maybe he could have done that a bit better. But he he was a good manager. There's no doubt about it. Is that is you think that move is because he was old school in a way, an old school I think, manager? I think it's very difficult for see homegrown players mm-hmm. at that point. I always felt as though it was hard for them to to come through, very hard. And you had to elevate yourself. Do you know what I mean to to make sure you were doing enough to keep in the team, but which is the way it should be. Yeah, because obviously I think Batten, but obviously your day Everton was more. It was strict and disciplined the way you had to do. You weren't allowed to be late. He said, "I knew it's a bit more. It's a bit more leeway now." I think back then, if you were late, you were like, basically totally like move game. <laughs> well, you you wouldn't you wouldn't be late unless you had a reason. Do you know what I mean? I don't really remember many people that were late. You know, maybe the car broke down or something. Traffic situation that would be it. Um. Because obviously you played with guys like um, obviously McLeod, Burns, Bona, Aiken, all the guys. Um, how was it? She obviously played with the guys. Um, did you ever? Obviously, for me these days, I think if I was playing with guys maybe that old, I don't know if I would be a bit no intimidated, but I'd be like, I'm training with him and him. But see, because you, you've already trained with him and played with him, did it no phase you step in and playing with the guys every week? Mm. Maybe initially, you know, the the thought of getting into the game with them, but once you were in it, no, you weren't intimidated. I remember uh, when I was in the the ground staff, which I'd commented about earlier, you know, we used to have the boot room and it was quite intimidating then because all these players were all coming in and Johnny Doyle was, I really liked Johnny Doyle when he was there, uh, a, a great character. Uh, but he used to give the boys see if his boots weren't clean I mean spotless the, he used to have rings and that on and he used to get you in the arm but it, it was all a bit harder than you up yeah, that's what he was basically doing do you know what I mean because he was a lovely guy but see, see like, I think obviously now I think health and safety wise <laughs> that can't happen it would be class it wouldn't brilliant, happen but, it would be brilliant think, but like you say Mark it kind of I think a lot of young guys are very, obviously well, I spoke to Alan Thompson on this before as well, and he says back then, obviously, they done some pranks and they wrote guys in the book room and kid a wee dig, etc. But it was yeah. it was all a laugh and a joke, and it was never... It was just basically to toughen you up and have a wee laugh and a joke with young guys. But like you say, it would never happen now because I, I personally think, Mark, young guys are too soft these days. Um, I don't think it would... I think it just couldn't happen these days. And I think back then, it's kind of took away for the game a wee bit. It, it toughens you up and... I think you would feel part of the team as well. Because I, I, I think what Alan Thompson says, no, Alan Thompson, sorry, some of the youth guys I've seen doing like podcasts in uh, previous months, etc., they've been saying like you kind of loved it away because you felt part of the squad. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Uh, and when you were going through the dressing room, I mean, what are you doing in here? Get out of this dressing room, all this kind of thing. <laughs> And you used to dread getting in, but it was it was fun and it was growing up and it was never severe. It was never to the point where it was it was going to distress you or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, if you were getting bullied for whatever reason, you have to speak up, mm-hmm. which I totally agree with. But uh, it wasn't like that. So obviously, as well, you played with Tommy Burns and obviously Burns Neil with the manager guys who aren't here anymore. Um, sadly, passed away. But I think the legacy is always going to be here at Celtic. Um, I don't think it's ever going to be forgotten how amazing they were as people, as players, and obviously as yourself played under McNeil. But how was Tommy Burns as a as a player? Obviously, Celtic fans know him as I only really know him as a coach at Celtic. I don't really know him as a player. 
Um, but by all accounts, um, he was a hell of a player. Passionate, skillful, great team player, great Celtic man, funny guy, great singer, great entertainer. Because I think, obviously, we've, we've seen him singing songs at events and stuff, and I've also spoke to his um, son as well, Jonathan, a while ago yeah. as well, and um, even to speak to Jonathan, it was, it was like I was talking to Tommy. I, I was, oh, it was, it was just... Obviously, it looks like his dad and he sounds like his dad and the stories he was telling, it was like I was talking to Tommy, just the way mm-hmm. he was. And I, I'm guessing if that was the way Tommy was, then, like he says, he must have been some some character in that dressing room as well. He was extremely passionate. Uh, as I say, Celtic through and through. You know, didn't like getting beat, didn't like the team not playing the right way. But his heart was in the right place, do you know what I mean? And extremely talented. So I'm guessing as well in that dressing room, um, there must have been a lot of, at least a lot of great memories, uh, funny pranks, and I just think being a, 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 around that dressing room with all the guys, that must have been, I know, I know you won a few trophies and stuff and might not win everything every year, but to be around the players, it must have been a special time to come through as a Celtic player. It was, it was, it was extremely special. Uh, the characters that were in the dressing room, like Sir Murdo and Davy Proven and Frank McGarvey and Roy, to name a few, do you know what I mean? There was loads. Uh, but it was, it was great to, to play in that team and you felt good getting out in the park with, with them. Because, see, like for me, like for me now, when I see like Celtic at the moment, if you've got Jota, Kyogo, etc., even when we had like Edward and Scott Brown, you kind of knew the game was already won in the tunnel. Did you kind of feel that sometimes when you played with the guys? Well, I, I knew that with the players I was going out with, that we were more than capable of winning the games. More than capable. Unless we were coming up against European opposition, which then becomes a different ball game. Ah, well, I think it's, that's maybe the exact same situation as the current crop, because obviously this year, obviously considering the situation... The Irons came into the, in the team that we've obviously not done too well in Europe. Did okay performance wise in the group stages, but obviously we're not out of Bodo. But like you say, it's a total different um, step up. And uh, it's similar to what you say, actually. It's kind of, I can I can take it, Mark, because we spoke to Kelvin Wilson, the old Celtic player recently, and, yeah. he, and he was saying that well, we can ask, we can ask him, why did Celtic drop points after Europe? Is it because you're playing against these top teams? And then come again against no offense, but playing teams like St. Mirren. And he basically mm-hmm. says, kind of I, because you're preparing yourself to play, i.e., Barcelona, and you're on a high for playing the guys, but then you're turning up and playing against St. Mirren. He says, it's no lack of motivation, it's just one of the things. It's a fact, and that's maybe why sometimes, like you say, European football, it, it's, a, it's a total different step up. That is, but you, you see it not only with Celtic, but a lot of teams struggle after they play European ties. But the best teams will always win, I suppose, the European tie and then do well in the next the next Saturday. Because obviously, I think Kelvin says that um, Kenny Lennon had a meeting with him and he says, look, why do we keep drawing or getting beat after Europe? What, what is it? And uh-huh. they, they came to the conclusion that it's because of the turning up to play against these guys, like your Messi, your Zavis, and then you're turning up to play against Dundee and you're like, it's just a total different... I don't think people outside of football might not understand it. They don't, no. the, the mental side of it, I don't think... Because for me personally, like sometimes when you're playing a Scottish Cup guy, tie against like a, a, a better team than you, you're right up for it. I want to go and prove these, these guys kind of wrong. But then the next week you could be playing the team both in your league and you're thinking, oh, we'll just turn up and win. It's a different mentality. I think that's just human nature in general, but it's but but you sh- I suppose when you're playing for a big team, you have to be ready to 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 win that game, whether it's against mediocre opposition or top opposition. It's just the I always listen to Roy Keane. It's the relentless drive to win, but not everybody's got it all the time. Was there any guy in the dressing room um, like a Roy Keane? It sounds obviously my dad can obviously was talking about Roy Aiton. Um, the, I think it was, I think it was the bear they call feed the bear. Um, feed the bear yeah. Was a lot of a, see like if you were losing games or 
there was was a somebody in the dressing room like a Roy Keane that would can I can I deal with that side of dressing room? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Roy, Roy, but I think all the players, some players could could see it verbally, and other players showed it on the pitch. The drive to to dig the team out, a, a bad performance or a bad result on the day. So some people did it verbally, and some people can do it on the pitch. Because obviously now we've got Cal McGregor, um, and we had Scott Brown bef- before that. We've always had. Can I, a very good captain. Who was the captain at the time in under your uh, squad, Mark? Danny. Dan McGrain. Danny McGrain. Oh, I'm guessing it's he's, more. he's probably, obviously I didn't see him play, but by all accounts, he's, at the time he was probably a world, he was probably one of the best in the world at that point. Without a shadow of a doubt, Danny McGrain was outstanding. Outstanding player. But before I even got to Celtic to that level, I mean, I had watched him on the TV, played for Scotland, and just outstanding. Had everything, everything a fullback. And look, look, Tierney a wee bit. Do you know what I mean, but better than Tierney, mm-hmm. and that's saying something. Because for by for what I've seen and obviously old footage and him by yourself and guys who have obviously documented stuff that they say that it was. If you if you want to put a world class right back at the moment, that was Danny McGrain. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because obviously he's well, but was it diabetes he's got as well, Danny McGrain? Yes, it was. Um, obviously, I don't know. I don't know if you would know, but how how back then did they manage that playing football? Was there a certain way you managed it to go through the games, etc.? No, uh, well, I'm not. I'm not particularly sure because he never spoke about it. Oh, uh, right. I do. I do remember one night, uh, one time we were up to Aberdeen and he started feeling unwell on the bus. And when we got to the hotel, he, he had to quickly get some desserts down him to get the sugar level back up. So that, that was the kind of first inkling that I had that he, he had that. Mm-hmm. But he never spoke about it. That's quite interesting um, that obviously it was... But did you think he would maybe know what to say that in case maybe they didn't get a game? In case it was maybe... But it's like everything else. I think in that era, people didn't speak about things. It's just the way it was. Uh, there, may have think... been other, there, there may have been other people that had something else wrong, do you know what I mean? They might have been depressed or whatever. Nobody spoke about anything. Yeah, obviously now it's mental health side there and I only see that everything's kind of... You'd like to I, think I, I, people, it's kind of out in the open now. Um, yeah. Another comment as well on YouTube, Mark, are you still in contact with anybody you played with? I still, I've seen Graham Sinclair and I've seen Roy Aitken and I still see a pe- couple of boys from Charlton when I was down there. Because I think, I, again, that probably shows you as well, maybe the team spirit as well. Because I think for me, a lot of, I think the football side has changed in these days, Mark, like for me, I don't think, obviously because there's camera phones and they're athletes now, they don't really go out and drink anymore, they don't really go to socialise anymore compared to now, back then. I'm guessing back then, the team spirits, even if you were losing games, you were still kind of very, very tight-knit. Very tight-knit, and I think that's the one thing that I would be pleased about, and a lot of people would be that there wasn't social media then, because it would have restricted a lot of things. Mm-hmm. See, see, back in your day, was there a, a drink culture or were you actually very, kind of, listen, we'll have a, a night out, but we need to be okay to train and, and, and obviously play to our best? Uh, I, I wouldn't say there was a big drinking culture. I would say that if we had a night out, there was drink involved, but there wasn't a big drinking culture. <laughs> no, definitely not. Because obviously... But we, had, now... we had many, many a good day, day out, Christmas, <laughs> and if we'd won something. You see, I like you say, is obviously clean boots, etc. See, did did you get any a wee Christmas bonus at all off signing the players? I can't remember. I can't remember. Uh, I'm not not entirely sure about that one. I maybe I probably did do, but just I can't remember. It's a long time ago. Because <laughs> ob- I think as well for me, Mark, as well, you played in the old Celtic Park. Um, yeah. For me, that's iconic. The fact that you played there, obviously, now it's. It's still kind of run about, but it's it's a different stadium and it's, it's still got that feel about it. And um, how was it to walk out to to obviously 
the old, and now now you're sitting in the stands seeing this. Is it totally different? Well, it's a, it's, when I go to the games now, the few games that I've been to, I mean, when you walk up the stairs and you see the stadium, it's just mind blowing. Mind blowing how good it is, especially on a big game. Uh, the old stadium was great as well. I remember going out in my first Old Firm game. I think it was in November, and the snow was coming down, and going out the tunnel, and you're next to the Rangers players, and it was just incredible atmosphere, incredible noise, everything about it, looking over at the jungle, and the Rangers end was full, and the Celtic end was full. It was just incredible. How, obviously, for me, I think, obviously, the rivalry is still massive, but I think back then it was proper, for me anyway, for what I can sense by what I've seen and heard, and from my dad, etc., that back then it was proper hated, it was proper Celtic Rangers. Um, there was a lot of uh, singing, the, mm-hmm. the the songs that shouldn't be sung. And I listen to all the Celtic songs now, and 90% of them, I think, are absolutely brilliant. And then you hear the, the small minority. Mm-hmm. Uh, other teams have got their issues, which I'll, uh, I'm not going to get into because you can hear it. Uh, but Celtic supporters, some of the minority still sing Songs about IRA and all this, and I'm like, oh, why do we need to listen? Because we've got so many good songs. Yeah, I probably say, Mark, I agree with you. It's, but see, when I go to games, even away games and stuff, that's maybe the only thing I hear, Mark. I don't hear, apart from maybe really? the odd show or that, I very rarely hear any. Because my dad goes to the odd game, but he, my dad's like, Ryan, the odd day, I'm like that. But for any game I've been there, very rarely it's all Celtic songs. But for me, yeah. when you watch, when you watch, some other team on TV, it's, it's for the first part to the last. <laughs> As I agree with that. I mean, when I, when I played, some of the songs were, it was hardcore stuff that was getting sang, and songs about Frank McGarvey's wife and all this kind of stuff. You know, and then there was songs about Rangers players, like Bobby McKean, who died in his car and all that, and they were all getting sung. It's just mind-blowing. And we... I think Celtic as a club do not even need to resort to all that. But it's only the minority, that's all I would say. It's a minority and it's hard. As you say, it's not heard a lot. Is that, did that have an effect the players on the park or does it mean is that professional that it didn't, it didn't enter, enter your, your, uh, your mind? No, it didn't affect anybody. No, it didn't affect anybody. It just, you just knew that the, the, the hatred in the stadium was quite... Unreal at times, but you just got on with it because that's the that's all you knew. Well, for me anyway, I, I think the the hatred <laughs> it's never going to leave this fixture. Um, no, it's never. But how was it to see playing in the games? Obviously, now for me, um, the atmosphere for me at every Celtic game I've been to is even especially the Rangers games. It's electric, and the game we. We beat um, Rangers recently at Celtic Park. That's one of the best atmospheres I've ever had. Been yeah. in, um, obviously, I don't know if it's because under the lights and we had to win the game. But was a is there any standout atmospheres at Celtic or in any games that you can remember? And maybe the jungle, the atmosphere was a anything that you thought, wow. I just think that particularly Rangers, particularly the Rangers game. Whenever you won, the atmosphere was just incredible hardly hearing yourself speak and the euphoria when you won was just the best feeling ever but then if you get beat it was the worst feeling ever you see back in your days well was there a lot obviously I, I, I can only go by research and stuff but was Rangers quite strong as well with some of the players back game is it very did you have to be really a really good Celtic team to win the league back then obviously now it's a bit more it's really only Celtic that. It's only really um, Celtic Rangers now. But I think back in your day, you had Aberdeen, etc. kind of challenging. Yeah. Rangers were a strong side. I would say that we had a, a good footballing side. Aberdeen had a good footballing side and a strong side. Mm-hmm. The United were the same. It, it was a much more balanced league. And it made for a lot of good games. I mean, we I won the, the league title the first two years. And basically, we threw it away the third year which we shouldn't have done, but that was just the way it, it worked out. But yeah, the like competition was... No, I think I'm sorry. 
the competition was quite fierce between the four teams. And even the teams like Sunan and that were decent sides. Because obviously as well, back then, the money compared to now, um, it was probably just pure talent um, as well. Because it's interesting as well how, obviously you're, you're a player, so you might not know the other side of it, but see back then, how would they go about getting players? Was it just word of mouth, etc.? Because obviously now you've got a big scouting scheme. How did it work back then? Well, it's the same, the same kind of thing as scouts. Oh, right. Just scouts all over the place. Uh, and as I say, a lot of players went to Celtic Boys Club, but, but all the, when Celtic, at under 16 level at Celtic, you had predominantly the, all the players that were S form were start to, that was them start to congregate on the under 16 side of things to then hopefully move into the next youth team and then the reserves. That's the way it would work out. So by the time I was at under 16 at Celtic, there was Willie McStay, Danny Craney, Charlie Nicholas, and a few other boys who could have had a chance, but mm-hmm. things passed by. Was there anybody, like you say, um, some guys that maybe should have or could have made it? Was a, Can you remember anybody that maybe could have made it and, and didn't at, at that point? Danny Donaldson was a left back that I said, thought should have made it. Hugh Ferry. Uh, from Castle Milk, who his nickname is Shanty, I would say he had everything in his locker to 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 make it. But it's just certain things will happen, and players drift away. As another player you mentioned, um, Charles Nicholas, sometimes, and he's punditry. Some fans don't don't like him, but um, how we how we see he can feel with his and how much he's a player. By all accounts, for what I've heard, he was a very very good striker. Very good, very good footballer. Uh, divides opinion now with his punditry. I think he has for a long time. Uh, but a great player in his first couple of years at Celtic, he was electric. Uh, he burst onto the scene and was a breath of fresh air uh, with his skill, his close control and his goals. And then he, he got his, his move, which he probably should have went to Liverpool at the time, but he chose Arsenal probably for a number of reasons and maybe the nightlife as well. Because <laughs> obviously I'm guessing back then London is not as big as it is now, but I think back then it was obviously an attraction back then as well. It is. I mean, I went to Charlton, but it wasn't the attraction of London. <laughs> <laughs> it was It was on a much lower level, but I loved it at Charlton. I had a great time there. I will obviously speak to you about yeah, Charlton as well down south because obviously that's... Um, Something I like to get into interest as well. See, see, obviously, see, did when you played the Celtic, did you train on Celtic Park or was it Barryfield back then? Was it, was it all different? Helen Vale. Is Helen Vale Helen still Bale. there? Is that, I'm sure there's Helen Vale, I'm sure there's Helen Vale streets, so I don't know if that's maybe where it was. There was an AstroTurf pitch there. Uh, we trained there, then we trained at Barryfield. And then also we trained at Celtic Park on certain occasions. But on the whole, it was Barryfield. Because obviously, I don't know if you've been near Barryfield uh, in a sense, obviously, playing, but it still doesn't look like it's changed much. <laughs> I've, not, I've not been along there for a long time. Um, uh, it's got an Astro Park now. Um, is it? It's got an Astro, but I, think, I don't know if it's been relayed. I've not seen it in a while, but it's got an Astro away at the back. And then it's obviously at the big grass area and it's just it was kind of just portal cabins I don't know if it's changed um, well, but that's the way it was now when we uh, when I trained there at under 14 level it was a red blaze pitch and then next day it was a grass pitch so that is what we did it's just it's crazy how obviously for your day to now even all the facilities are all changing um, because obviously I like to think guys like yourself Burns Aiton etc if you had Lennox Town, uh, I just imagine how good you'd even been BRA facilities. Oh, the facilities nowadays must be incredible. I remember uh, going back to my ground staff days, we used to get all the gear together, and they probably got everything, everything probably gets washed every day, but there were certain bits of gear that didn't get washed, like say your sweat top, and they had a drying room, and you used to put it in up in pegs and then the, the smell in there the next day was terrible because <laughs> of the training gear incredible 
she she it's I'm trying to as well, Mark. She when obviously when he's full time it was Celtic, yeah. yeah. Is it right? Yeah. Um because obviously see now some some teams and well, most teams been players at that Celt- Celtic and they might only train for like two hours a day. How was your schedule back then? Was it was it more than that back then? No, pretty much the same. Do you know what I mean? There'd be certain days that you would you might train from ten till twelve or ten to half eleven on a Friday when we've got the game the next day. It was you would get at ten and you would probably back in at eleven. And then you were left the park by quarter to twelve. Do you know what I mean? The afternoon sessions were mostly at the start of the season. Not many times would we come back. Do you know what I mean? All changed for that side of things. Ah, uh, because I think obviously now sometimes they do double sessions, etc. And like you say, they have morning sessions, lunch, etc. Um, because see when you were there, did, did you get fed as well? Like your lunches and etc. Then as well, no? No, nothing like that. We yeah. used to get into five or six of us used to get into Ian Skelly's, the car dealer, and we we knew the guy that that was selling the cars there, and we used to just go into their cafeteria. That's where we would meet. <laughs> So, so, so I'm guessing back then your diet was really up to you until yeah. you but you fancied to eat and what you thought was right for your body back then. Yeah. I've seen players pre match meal getting a steak. <laughs> so I think, uh, they would be looked frowned upon now, do you know what I mean? We all are uh, they you could basically have within reason I don't mean that they would have steak and chips or anything like that, but just mm. they would maybe have things back then that were a bit heavier in their stomach than they should have. We weren't just the, the diet side of things just wasn't there. Do you know what I mean? But it it should have been. There are questions, well, Mark, from uh, YouTube as well. How how was the jungle compared to the modern day Green Brigade? Was it is it any is it so much to a different comparison? Well, the jungle was was uh, was longer, wider, uh, not as high, obviously. Uh, a lot of noise come out of there. And a lot of noise. I I love the Green Brigade. I think it creates an absolutely brilliant atmosphere. Uh, and the noise is incredible. I mean, they've done they've done well. Do you know what I mean with what they've done? I think as well. Sometimes it gets looked upon with Green Brigade as well. Yes, yeah, sometimes maybe their opinions are a bit up and down. But they do a lot for the community as well, food banks and charities. And I think sometimes Mark that gets. Overlooked, swept under the carpet because they might sing a silly song or yep. doing that. But they, but it's it's that's for ninety minutes. You've got to remember that's a football game. What they're doing outside it should out, out outweigh a silly be like you see a be silly fucking song. I think as long as they as long as they stay within the perimeter of what's right and what's wrong within the club because they can't let the club down and and that's why on on the odd occasion they have. But as you say, they've done more good than not, and some great causes. Yeah, I would. I, I'd, I'd agree with what you say there, Mark. Because, like we've said, a lot of things Scottish football gets swept under the carpet. But as soon as Celtic do something, it's it's boom. Um, it's I've got another comment as well from Gerald. He says, "Do what a game? What, what a game on Sunday, Mark?" <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, think, I, don't think my, I don't think my joints would take it. <laughs> um, but I think it's just interesting. About, see the fact that, see back in the day as well, see obviously Sunday was a massive game against Rangers. See leading up to the games back then, was there a lot of anticipation? Did, did they train harder? Was there anything you'd done in particular? Or was it just, let's just go again, it's another game? No, 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 it wasn't just another game. There was a, a, a special build-up to, to games. We may get to even see Mill Hydro for some of the big games. And you knew when you were going there that this was this was big. Uh, but the, the preparation was always there for a big game. Always. Because I think now, um, these games are obviously massive. Um, big game me- is Sunday. I, I I believe if obviously I hope I, I do believe we'll win, but I think if you stay unbeaten, you'd like to think you should be the league. Um, because I can't see Celtic losing three games. I think we'll win on Sunday. I think the the worst scenario a draw, 
that were more than good enough. Got a, got a great team, and I think the manager's done incredible. Probably the best there's been, best manager there's been for a long time. A long time. Obviously, we had um, Rogers and his kind of first season and a half, two years, it was really, really good. Um, but the brand of football for me, Mark, that Andrews brought in, when Rogers came in, it was a breath of fresh air. But now you, you look at the football he's trying to play. It kind of took me a few weeks, Mark, to kind of understand what he was trying to do. I was like, why is he just attacking the whole thing? These inverted fullbacks, I was like, I don't like these. It's made yeah. me very, very vulnerable down the sides. Yeah. I, think it was a, I think it was a game against who we were playing. I think it was Dungeon United at home. And Ralston kept going in and Taylor. And I, they, they were leaving a big, big space because Abada was a way, way up out wide. Mm. And I'm thinking, we're going to get took apart here. We're a very good team. But the more the season's been on, I, I can understand what he's trying to do. And you can can I see now it's starting to work. I, I agree with you because I thought that myself, the way he was doing it. I remember a game against Real Betis over there and Celtic in the first 20 minutes could have been 3 nothing up. They totally outplayed them. But I remember saying to whoever it was I was watching the game with that I can see us in trouble in the second half because of the gap. The gaps were just incredible. And, and Real Betis did come back that game. Uh, but he's worked it out well. The manager's done done well. It's... He's obviously he infiltrates areas and he gets them all in, and it's just been great to watch. I think he's special praise for the the players that he's brought in. How they've all they've all fitted in. It's just the the, the Japanese boys have been great. Uh, great. I watched clips of uh, Maeda before he came because I knew his name was getting mentioned, and I, and I could see right away what what he was going to bring to the team. I actually think he's. He's still not showing you what he can do. I think next year he will show us. Yeah, I was a wee bit, I was a wee bit touch and go in my head when he first came in. A few of these games, I was like, is he just going to run all day? And no, actually. No, he's but got much more see, than that. You can see now, especially I thought on Sunday, him and Kyogo linked up really well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But uh, no, it's, the way he's brought the team together, I'm very confident. Not overcome, but very confident we'll win. You see, obviously, the way football is now with Ange. Um, was there any manager you played under, either down south, or McNeil, or David Hay, that anything that they'd done was similar, attacking-wise, yeah. or was it all completely different? Completely different. I think football in general was completely different because you were quite regimented to your position at times. Whereas... I think nowadays players have got the, the license to to go into other positions because they know that someone else may just fill in for them. Do you know what I mean? And as you say, watching uh, Greg Taylor, you know, he comes away into a midfield position at times and you wonder how it's all going to work out, but you then start to see how it is, it's planning out and how the possession just, they keep the possession, that's what he's what to do. Because I think for well, a lot of Celtic fans, but me, me especially, Mark, I, I've got a very, very different opinion on Greg Taylor for a lot of fans. I, I still don't think he's... I don't know if it's because we had Kieran Tierney. Yeah. But he, he tries. He's he's definitely improved on Durange. He has improved. But, um, I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to be looking for the future. I always try to look to the future. And if we're going to get, by winning the league, you're going to get in the group stages... I just kind of see, I think we need to buy better quality for left-back. Maybe Greg Taylor could do it for a cover, for a second, maybe, and maybe be okay for the SBL. But I think, for me, it's just, it's just my opinion. If we want to go into Europe, you're going to play a lot better teams than we played in, obviously, the group page of Europa League. You might get Barcelona or you might get Real Madrid. And I think to compete with these guys, you might need to send a bit better quality, but that's just my opinion. I don't know what you think. <sighs> I don't like criticising players, but I can see where people's opinion is coming in on Greg Taylor and other players. I think, to his credit, over the last half a dozen games, he's played really well. He's mm. played really well, so maybe maybe he's reaching a point where he, he can sustain that level of performance and surprise a lot of supporters. I hope he does, mm. but I understand people that may have reservations. I, I just... I just... When he first came in this year and played, 
And obviously, I don't really want to judge anybody in last season because I think for me, Mark, last season, I think, I don't know what you think, Mark, but I think in maybe five years or ten years, somebody will mention something in a book or a podcast. I think something will come out about it because it was, it was for me, it was too bad to be true. I don't know, it if, was it to do, don't know if it was to do with players, managers... Was it COVID related? Was it because for me, I, I I do believe Rangers were hiding COVID cases. I've seen it. I've I've heard about it. I do believe it was. Cause I can remember there was one game. Mark, I don't think you remember it, but Philip Hollander tested positive in uh-huh. the Wednesday morning versus they were playing Falkirk, I think, in the Scottish Cup. But yet, nobody for Rangers had to isolate. So he's obviously trained beforehand. But when we went to Dubai. Stupid enough, I know we went, and we stupid enough that Julian went, even though he was in rehab. Why did they all have to isolate in the rule? Uh, for me, it was just last year. For me, it was very. I think eventually something will come out, Mark. I don't know if it will, but I've got an inkling that someday I'll eventually will say something because it was too good to be true. So I don't want to judge many players for last year because if you want to judge players, you would say Ralston would have been playing with party Fisher this season. Yeah. And then you look at him now, he's a very able second command to, for me, who I think is, I don't want to say he's better than Celtic, but I think Juranovic is, is top, top draw. Juranovic is top drawer. I would agree 100% with that. And whoever got him to Celtic Park deserves a medal. Uh, Ralston has done exceptionally well. Uh, his, his improvement is tremendous over the last year. Tremendous. And as you say about last year, Celtic were really bad, really bad last year. And it was a horrible watch to see what might have been and and what happened. I'm actually experiencing that with Man United just now, watching them, <laughs> how they have capitulated, do you know what I mean, to a level that's hard to watch. But Celtic, that was Celtic last year. And that, that's why we're, we're all mesmerised with what the manager has done. Because I'm agreeing mm-hmm. with another comment on the YouTube from Gerald. Um, I believe that if I was fans, it would have been a lot different. Because um, I, I don't think the manager would have, would have lasted to he did with fans <laughs> on the ground. I don't think the fans would have stood for it. I don't think, I think there would have been demonstrations last year long before the end of the season. And it was just as well. Because it wouldn't have been a good sight. I think it would have been worse than some of the sights we did see. That was yeah. a handy stadium. Um, Jerry would say as well, Mark, were you in the squad against Juventus in 81? Yes, I was. I, I played uh, at Celtic Park in the first game and we won 2 nothing. And the Juventus team at that level, I don't know if you've ever looked at their lineup. No, I haven't, Mark, no. Oh, my God. It was 90% of the Italian team that went on to the World Cup. Uh, incredible team and we beat them 2-0 but we went out over there the atmosphere there was incredible got to the the stadium about an hour before it and it was jam-packed uh, and they had some team who were too good for us on the night who, Was there any, any players that we might actually remember that played with played them back then any standouts? Oh, not you won't remember you won't remember but Oh, Serea was the defender that played with the World Cup. Tardelli, you may have seen him in 1982 after he scored. They won 4 1 in the final, and he, he's one of the iconic photos of him getting away after he's waving his hands to the Italian music. But the team was full of them. Paolo Rossi. Mm-hmm. I've, I think I've heard of Tardelli, I think I've heard of him before. Um, see, obviously, back then, for me, obviously, the European stage is. I'm wanting Celtic to do very well, and it was that something you set out to do every year. It was obviously no track. Obviously, yeah, every aim is to go and win every competition you're in. That's that's why you go in competitions. But was there anything at the start of the season like any plans to do in Europe? Or was it just take every game as it comes and hopefully try and try and do something? Take every game as it comes, and I think when we played against the opposition, we always felt as though we had a chance, a good chance. But ultimately, we we didn't get as far as we should have at times. Because for, for me as well, um, as a football player, I think, I love knowing how players cope with travelling. 
like training, traveling, and then coming back and playing again. Did you ever feel tired and jaded after playing games abroad at all? No, particularly. No, no, particularly. I think I think we all coped reasonably well with that. Maybe if you come back and had injuries, that might have been the thing that you didn't have enough time to to recover, and you may have had to play in the, uh, at the weekend. So you may have played and not been a hundred percent, but that's just the nature of the game, and you have to get on with it. See as well, like you said, you played with Celtic, but you've scored as well for Celtic. How was the feeling of scoring your first goal? Was is that something you always remember to to the day you obviously to the to basically the day you die? <laughs> uh, great scoring for Celtic. Great, great getting uh, the accolade. It's a wee bit extra accolade, especially when you're playing defender and you're, you do, you don't get the recognition or the praise as other players get because it's it's normally forwards that get most of it. Uh, so to to get a goal was was great, and then to know that your your parents or friends were in the stand watching. I mean, it's a big thing. See, hey, it's for me, Mark, as well. I've done the Celtic too recently, um, because I played the Celtic part years ago and I was a wee guy, but I didn't actually did change in the dressing room to somewhere else. See, when obviously it's different, it's changed now the the, the stadium, but see now. I don't know if you, have you been recently to Celtic Park in a tour or anything, no? No, not a tour. Um, we'll see the Celtic dressing room is right under where the tunnel was, that can I stand? Right. And obviously that must be amazing to see when it's a, just see a Rangers game and they're all singing walk alone before you, that must be absolute goosebumps. Could you hear that from the stadium, the stand shooting? Oh, oh, definitely, definitely, but the, you'll never walk alone in the new stadium is hard to beat. You know, whenever you're there or you see it on the television, it just goosebumps. It's hard to describe and it's hard to imagine that you walked out to that in your lifetime. I I just think, I, I love speaking to yourself, Mark, plays I played with Celtic. Because um, like, like you say, for me as a fan, you turn up to the game, you, you come up the stairs to your seat and you're just like, every time, you, for me, every time I go, I'm like, wow. It's just, mm-hmm. it, it, there's a, I don't know if it's just, uh, if it's just Celtic or every fan feels the same going to their stadium, but there's just something about Celtic Park for me that it's just, it's amazing. Uh, you just walk it's in the ground and it's just, it's, even when I got the tour, obviously you weren't allowed to go in the, um, the, the park, but you walk through a turn and you're thinking, Barson's walked through here, Sutton. They're yeah. just thinking these guys have walked through here. And I, I'm doing that as well. It's uh, it's very, it's kind of, it's very, very. How how can I explain it? You're kind of you're speechless in a way. Yeah. But the fact that I I you need to pay twelve pound or whatever it is to go and get a tour, but it's just amazing to see this because you only really see it for the stand. You don't actually see it. It's great for supporters to get that close and personal and, and what the feeling may have been like, it's equally as good for ex-players. When I, when I, if I've been up a couple of times as a guest at the games, to go into the, to go in through the front door and then to walk up and see the lights and the green and white scarves and the pitch immaculate and the teams coming out, it's just, as you say, it's it's Celtic. It's, it's with you throughout your life. See, uh, do you ever get noticed now, Mark? Obviously, you're a bit older now, but do people still kind of kind of recognise you? Obviously, the older generation. Yeah, yeah, I get I get recognised occasionally. Do you know what I mean not not in any great mm. scale or anything like that? But no, I sometimes do. do you know what I mean, and a lot of people live locally, know me, and they'll they'll talk away to me about the game and different things. Because I, for me, Mark, anyway, I can guys like yourself and. And playing your era, I can generally talk to you for hours because there's so much you can go through about your, your years playing with Celtic, and it's it's just the way that how football's all changed. Yeah. But from your day, um, even like you said, the pitches. How was the pitches at Celtic Park back then? Was the pitch actually okay, or was was there days where you're thinking, do we actually need to go and play in that? <laughs> the pitches are nowhere near the standard that they, they are nowadays. Nowhere near it, and we had to play in pitches that were. Snow, do you know what I mean? They were bumpy. Uh, 
No, the standard was not as good. I mean, they're like bowling greens now. Well, see, back then, like you says, you were part of the groundsman team. Was the groundsman full time as well back then? Yeah, they were full time, and we just we sweep the stadiums. We got the training kit out, cleaned the boots, just all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it was good. It was good. A comment, got a comment as well from Gerald again, um, Mark. What was it like to play against Bobby Russell and Jim Bett? Uh, two great footballers. I remember Russell when he played for Sheffield Juniors, Cranton player. I don't know the guys, but was it, uh, how were these footballers? Bobby Russell uh, and Jim Bett were exceptional players. Bobby Russell was very silky, quite a slim guy. Glided, glided through a game. Uh, Jim Bett had two good feet, which was shouldn't be, but it is. It's unusual in football. Do you know what I mean? Because it, it's such an advantage to have. Uh, two of them were very good, but Bobby Russell was a really good player. He would have fitted in with Celtic. <laughs> like you say, I was a right footer. My left foot was for standing on. Um, one of the only guys who I can... Like, Mirachi, you just didn't know what, what was his uh, um, he's a He's a player that I just think the world of, do you know what I mean? Watching him play, how, how he was never picked up to play at a higher level. Well, he did play at a high level, but I'm talking about one of the big, big teams in Europe. Uh, he was an incredible player for Celtic. Incredible. Obviously, in your day, Mark, you've, obviously, I don't know how bad the press were to Celtic. Um, but for me, I'm a big... I'm a big advocate for... I generally believe that the press are obviously against Celtic. I, just, I think Everton's... But for me, at the weekend there, Celtic coasted past Ross County. Um, in BBC, there's a BBC Sports under BBC Scotland. The headline was "Nervy Game for Celtic," and I'm thinking, why? What? what what's this all about? Um, and it's Rangers come back for uh, Rangers come back for ten men and one three one, and you're thinking it's just was there anything like that? Was there anything like that? Did that? Obviously, I'm not. I'm not going to say too much. But was there anything in your era that you thought that? And the direction you usually are thinking, what, what is this all about? Was, did that ever come a fruition back then? Uh, I, not as much as it is nowadays. Do you know I mean, there was headlines, but nothing that I would go into as sinister as that. It, it seems to be pretty obvious nowadays that there is an agenda. <laughs> That's my opinion. Because when you say that, you're obviously <laughs> you're paranoid or you're this, you're that, and I do believe that um, Celtic, when we won the quadruple treble, I still don't think we've had enough credit for it because the Rangers weren't at their best. Or, but that's their fault. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that Celtic have got to beat what they beat, uh, who they can beat and who's there. Um, I think this year it's just showed you as well. Sorry, last year Celtic were probably the worst I've been in a long, long, long maybe since O'Neill, before O'Neill took yeah. over, maybe. Um, and Mowbray was bad, but I think. The fact that Rangers couldn't win a treble then, it just shows you how hard it is to win trophies and how consistently well Celtic have been. For me, I think, Mark, I seen a start the other day, I think for the last 20 odd years, I think Celtic have won so many titles. It's been phenomenal how, how much success for me since I've been a Celtic fan. All I've really seen is success. Um, I've been quite spoiled. I've been, <laughs> been through like my dad in the 90s and that's some right. some bad. I think the seventies were really quite bad as well. The seventies. Yeah, yeah. So I've been lucky. So I think, but I'm the more I'm getting older, and obviously I played football. Football's a crazy game. Tomorrow, Celtic could be. They could be away. It could be there could be something happened in two two weeks time. We've lost the league. That's why I'm saying on this that it's if we win the league, it's no when you've got a when you've got the title. That's when you celebrate. That's when I'm, I try and know it too. Obviously, I'm, I'm confident and I want to say the league's funny, but you've got to be you've got to be wary of obviously football these days. Um, that's just my opinion on that anyway. Well, if, God forbid if, if Rangers do win on Sunday, the pressure is on. That's It's going to be quite relentless and you're talking about headlines and papers, you'll soon see them. They'll be out in force <laughs> then and a lot of people will enjoy that, but Hopefully Celtic will play really well uh, on Sunday. You ha- your era has been spoilt with Celtic, from Martin O'Neill mm-hmm. all the way through Brendan Rodgers. It's been 
It's been a great spell. Um, and obviously, uh, he put on under David Hay as well. Um, and was was Brian McClure as well, Murphy as well? Yeah, Brian um, McClure, Morris Johnson, Alan McAnally. Oh, oh, how was, obviously, the guys have mentioned that obviously no Johnson's a bit of a me, but I'm guessing he was, a, he was obviously a good player. Yeah, a very good player. Good striker, great goal scorer, worked his socks off. Highly controversial going to Rangers, but that's another story. But I think as well, um, obviously, that's his name is always going to be tarnished no matter what, don't you say, because of that. Yeah. Um, like you say, Alan McInerney, etc. How was David here? Obviously, was he completely different for Bugger McNeil? Was it totally different managers? Or was it because of the, the same era? It was kind of the same type of management style? I like David here. Uh, he was quite an aggressive man on the touchline. And he, he made you want to go out there and do it for him. Uh, near the end of my time at Celtic... I had been in and out of the team, so he, he had bought players to replace me, and then I had managed to get back in. But I always felt as though, you know, that I, he did he did fair with me, and I didn't really have any complaints about that. Um, because obviously Brian McClare was that did the good man you after Celtic from then? Brian McClare? Yeah, yeah, he did. Eh? Um, he went to the United. Obviously, he must have been really good to go to Man United, but how was how was he that striker as well? We see, could you tell Brian McClure, Brian McClure could play he could in, go higher midfield, he could play in midfield and get goals, he could go up front and get goals. He, he was a good footballer, really, really good footballer. He who deserved was, his move. Who was a uh, well, I'll ask you who was your best player, is, but see, back then as well, like you say, he got a move. Do you think back then as well, because of times are changed now, there's more wages. There's money, I think, back then, like maybe you were getting, I don't know, again, I don't I don't care about wages, but maybe you were getting 20 quid a week Celtic back then. I don't know what it was, right? Just say hundred pounds a week. But a man you may get five hundred pounds a week. Was that a big attraction back then as well? Well when I when Charlton came in for me, uh Charlton were in the bottom. I, it was in the April they showed interest in me, so it was towards the end of the season. And they were at the bottom of the second division, uh, in danger of going into the third division with about four games to go, which they didn't go down. But when I signed there, I got more money at Charlton than I did at Celtic. That's crazy, isn't it? More money there. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and then when I went to Charlton, they, they signed about seven players. And, you know, I gave you the story that we could have went into the third. We, we, we stayed in the second. So it wasn't a premiership, it was just the first, the second, the third and the fourth. So we stayed in the second division and we get promoted the first year to the first division. So it was just an incredible turnaround. But like, the wages wages were more. Mm-hmm. But it's a, it's a more expensive place to live. Yeah. How 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 was, um, obviously, how did you see back then, obviously, now that there's agents? Was, that, was there any agents back then or was it just through basic telephone back then? No, nope, just nothing. Just somebody came and came in for me. I had a conversation with him, asked me what, what you want. Do you know what I mean? Then it was a, a discussion. You're either getting it or you're not getting it. And that was it. Do you know what I mean? Just, there was no real player power, none. If you if you decided to go against the like Celtic, if, if I had went against Billy McNeil or anything like that over a contract situation, ben. I'd have got shown the door. <laughs> it's uh, it just shows you how it's changed now. Like players can come in and demand this, and players have got a bit of power. Um, yeah, but obviously, you say Charlton Quinn was a. Why did you leave? Was it just um, a different a different opportunity, or did you feel you were going to get more game time? Maybe Charlton. I was the last season. I was in and out of this team, and it was pretty pretty obvious that I had to move on. Uh, and Charlton come in for me, and I didn't know much about him. Although I knew, I knew the names of a couple of the players. Uh, so I went down there, and it was a gamble, big gamble. Uh, but I managed. I went down there, and I got into the team right away, and I managed to get in the second division team of the year, uh, which was voted by by all the other players in the division that year. So I did did well down there, and I was. They thought highly of me. 
which was good. I mean, I obviously you well as well. Did you play with Scotland under twenty one as well? I had a couple of games, a few games of them. Some how, some differences. How was uh, international football then? Was that was that a big thing for you as well? Did you have aspirations or was it? If you, when you get picked, you go, oh, that was, that's, that's, that's a brilliant name you picked for Scotland here. I, I love playing for Scotland under 21s. I, I probably felt as though at that point to, to get into the Scotland team, I, my performances had to be another notch up and mm-hmm. I maybe wasn't capable of that or it didn't happen for me. But I, it's interesting to say that, Mark, because from, from what I've heard and maybe from my research, Celtic players didn't really get a lot of Scotland call-ups back then. So you're maybe a bit hard on yourself, Mark. You, you you probably could have got a Scotland cap, but you maybe weren't weren't given one for one reason or another. <laughs> yeah. I probably when I went down to Charlton, I probably played as well as I had done. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether that was you know, playing for Celtic is a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure all the time, and then you go down there and it's a di- different scenario. A different type of pressure, different manager. So felt as though when I was down there, that was one of my my best spells. In our comment as well, uh, Mark Jenner says that he had an interview. He says for McCoy, he says was Dens Park a really good surface back then. Dens Park, yeah, it was. Dens Park was a good pitch. Yeah, it was, it was nice and big. It suited us. Because mm-hmm. I think it's interesting that, like he says. Celtic's part was okay and then other teams it just shows you now Celtic's probably if not one of the best in Scotland um, yeah. it's totally changed I think when Rodgers tried to come in and change it and now for me it's, it's, it's like you say the grass is lovely and it's like a bowling green and this is why you, sometimes you get the the fruits of these good players like their Jotas and your Kyogos because have got this to play on. I don't yeah. know if Jota and Kyogo would have been able to cope in the park shoe play, don't they? They'd be like, nah, I can't play in this. This is too, it's too sticky, it's too bobbly. <laughs> probably, probably. No, it's a different level now. Listen, I've got, I'm looking at my battery and I've got about 10 minutes left just to, to ah, sound you. I've only five minutes away anyway. Um, ah, it's just to sound you just in case. Ah, sorry, mate. I don't want to cut off. It's a pretty good conversation, mate. Um, who, who who's the best you played with? As it Celtic or I? Who's the best you played with and against? Danny Danny McGrain, without a shadow of a doubt, Danny McGrain. Against, as I said, the Italian players in that Juventus team were just out of this world. Gordon Strachan was a difficult player to play against. We played Man United. He played. Uh, and he was a great player. David Cooper was a good player. David mm-hmm. Cooper. I enjoyed playing against him, but he was a good player. Chris Waddle at Tottenham. Uh, another brilliant player. It's Some of the names you're running off, Mark, it's actually... You've actually done quite a lot, mate. <laughs> I, think, yeah. um, I think, obviously, you're saying that you... That you've done okay. I think you may be going to say a bit of distrust, uh, Mark, because some of the guys you've played with and... Uh, put against to get to that level, you must have been very good, Mark. Um, I've, 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 I've done, I've, I've done well for myself. Do you know what I mean? And I think I've done my family proud as well. Do you know what I mean? They're all extremely proud. My my son's got a my one of my cup final strips in a lovely frame with my medals. He went and got it specially oh, made. He he was living up in Aberdeen, and he he went to someone and the the job the guy's done, and he's got ones with my strips in them as well. So. I can see by the, the way he is with the strips, what it means to him and my two daughters. Well, as I, I think if if, if I ever have any kids and my son plays with Celtic and his in for that, it, it'd be amazing. Um, it's it definitely. I, it's again, Mark. It's to find out the guys you played with, and obviously your career. It's been amazing to talk to you. Um, the last two we minutes, we obviously talk spoke about Ange. What's your um, how how have you felt he's been with Celtic and how uh, how they are at the moment? I listened to him coming in at the start and I knew I know there was a big uproar about who is he and whatever else. I, I listened to him right away and I said I said to my wife, I says, I like him. I like him. I says, he's going to do well. I loved his attitude. I loved the way he spoke. Uh, at every press conference he does, 
He's he's interesting. He speaks the truth. He doesn't suffer fools. Uh, he knows what he wants for Celtic, and I think I hope the club tie him down to a, a good contract because if he if he keeps going and if he does well in Europe, he's going to be in demand. And then if he was to leave, then the cycle could change again. Just like you were talking, is don't take everything for granted that we we get and enjoy it. That's something I think. Um, obviously, Rodgers was the first guy who had a contract in a long time. Um, I think and has got to make the next one. Um, so I think as well, the victories against Rangers recently, and if we win the title, it's going to get bigger clubs looking. That's just natural. He's yeah. opened the door. He's opened the, the, the basically shop window for himself. Yeah, um, yeah. But the way he talks and the way the players are talking, the contracts he's gave these players, I think he's here for a, the long term. Um, and like you say, I do believe, Mark, after winning the league this year, and he's still the manager, I, I, I can't see how you, you get worse, you can only get better. I think if we if we get the league, the, the money that's available, I'm sure that he'll, he'll purchase a couple of players that will add to us next year. And I look forward to the European games next year. I think we'll, we'll do well. We... We may get further than normal, do you know what I mean? But I just think that we'll we'll be equipped to play against top teams better. Top teams. Yeah, I agree, mate. Um, I know your party's going to be soon, mate. No, so, I've got a few minutes. Uh, Don't worry about it. Sure. I've got a few minutes. Um, uh, just give me a heads up, mate, and then I'll, I'll let you go. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm with you, mate. I really believe that Angie's he's building something here. Definitely. I think it's in Southern, where we came from, and I just said it on the podcast the other night that even though you've got Jürgen Klopp, you've got Guardiola, Ancelotti, etc. With the budget that Andrew's got, could they come in and do the same? Never. I, Never. I, I, I personally, it doesn't matter if a world-class managers, they're used to spending a lot of money. Andrew's going to, like Van Dyke marks into £5 million, right? Celtic might spend that over five seasons. I know. And you're getting Rangers fans now saying, oh, he's spent that. Celtic have got a net spend of £10 million profit. So Celtic have no spent money. I know. I just think, I mean, you heard the the big hurry about Gerard, what he had achieved at Rangers. And he achieved very little, to be honest. He done well. He done well in Europe. They always equipped himself well. He won one league in three years. And then you look at what, Potentially, Angie's going to do. Mind blown. Ah, yeah, it's like, like you say, it's an, you could talk about that again in, in another podcast that um, made eight or nine attempts to win trophies and he won one. And for me, it was it was due to a season where a lot of teams suffered. Uh, yeah. I think if it was a level playing field, I don't think that would have happened. It might have, it might have won the league, but it wouldn't have happened the way it did. Definitely. Um, but again, Mark, I'll, I'll obviously I'll, I'll kind of let you go away. And obviously, there's another game we can watch tonight. We can hopefully see Leipzig win the night. Um, <laughs> but again, mate, honestly, Mark, it's been a privilege to honestly talk to you about the guys you've played with in your career. And hopefully, for the older generation, they can maybe look back and kind of memories and guys you've played with. And hopefully, it's enjoyable for them as well. But again, Mark, I'll uh, let you go away. But hail, hail, and take care. Thank you very much, Ryan, for having me on the show. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Hail, Thanks, hail. Mark. Hail, hail. Let's win on Sunday. Thanks, mate. Cheers, mate. No Cheerio. more. Take care.